we're going to be talking about diversity. Diversity, in other words, that's my Ohio Southern accent. Uh, if you were here last week, you know what that's all about. So we're talking about diversity. Diversity is really, really important for the family unit, especially when it comes to a family church. Diversity, it's simply a simple definition is this. It's a variety within a group. When I lead or preach or teach, I don't want everyone to look like me, think like me, act like me. We need a different kind of perspective. It's like if I were to compare it, I would, I would, I'm laughing before I even get there, okay? Because I tried to work it in this week and I think I'm pretty successful at it. It's like walking into a donut shop. And you walk into a donut shop and you have a variety of donuts. Who wants to go to a donut shop with only one donut? Not me. I don't know what kind of human being goes into a donut shop and only eats one donut, okay? We probably can't be friends. So I want a variety of donuts to choose from. A variety is better. I mean, think about going to a restaurant or an ice cream parlor or a donut shop and you only get one option. Not going there. I like to mix things up, okay? So a variety within a group is what diversity is. And that's something that as the church we should strive for. And we're going to look at today why and how we accomplish that. John Maxwell, when he talks about a deficit to a Christian leader, and I even apply this to our faith, one of the worst deficits we could have as a church family, as a Christian, or even just as a leader in general, is to have what he calls an insulated perspective. It's when you only see the world through your perspective, through your opinion. It is dynamically important, if we are going to be a successful church, to see things through the eyes of other people. And that, that's what we're going to be looking at and pushing forward to as a family church. A great comment that I saw this week is by Art Mortel. He wrote to master the inner game of selling, and he put it like this. He says, I love playing chess. Whenever I'm losing at chess, I consistently get up and I stand behind my opponent to see the board from his side. Then I start to discover the stupid moves that I've made because I can see it from his viewpoint. The salesperson's challenge is to see the world from the prospect's viewpoint. If we are going to reach people with the gospel of Jesus, if we are going to love them where they're at, if we are going to grow as a church family, we've got to see life from where people are at. As a Christian leader who has studied the Bible for, for many years now, one of the things that we struggle with the longer you're in the church is you struggle with something that's called the curse of knowledge. You forget what it's like to not know. And so you fail to realize what it's like to be on the other side. So sometimes if you've been in the church for a while, you'll hear me preach. It might seem overly simplistic. Well, that's because I try to think about the people sitting in the pews who's never heard the gospel before. We've recently been blessed with several families who joined the church, and they really don't know that much about the Bible. Uh, they don't know where books of the Bible are. They don't know what the Bible really is, whether or not it's God's word. So if we are going to reach people, if we are going to be the church that God is calling us to be, we have to view things from their perspective. And man, it is certainly true what my life would be like without Angel. If I only view, Angel's my wife, not like some mystical person. If I only viewed, right, if I only viewed life through my perspective, I would feel sorry for the people that I'm around right? And that's her bringing balance to me. So I am what I am with her balance, all right? So we would be really bad without her perspective. But think about it. If we were to live our marriage through only our perspective and we never tried to see things from our spouse's perspective, or as a father, if I only made decisions based on my perspective and not how my kids viewed life and the world around them, I would really shortchange our family. That's why diversity is so important. And so as a Christian, it can be potentially destructive when we make decisions for our own perspective and our own wants. And our challenge as a Christian is to see God's viewpoint. That's what we want to accomplish. How does God see this person? How does God see this situation? How does God see this thing that he wants us to do or this thing that he's called us to do or this opportunity? What would God have me do approaching this situation? Well, I think it's important to clarify before we move on that just because I use the word diversity doesn't mean I'm using a dirty word, but it can be used in the wrong way. When we think about worldly diversity, worldly diversity says that everyone is equal in value and in function. Everyone should be the exact same. Well, I don't think that that's true. Worldly diversity has become an enforced acceptance. Tolerance means you have to promote my viewpoint, not just hear my viewpoint. And it can even be of things that are evil or unnatural. 
When I talk about diversity, remember, we are using the parameters of God's perspective and God's viewpoint on the issue. And here's what Satan likes to do. Satan likes to take the things of God, like diversity, and he likes to twist them in such a way that makes them sinful. He'll do this with sex. He'll do this with marriage. He'll do this with emotions. He'll do this with doctrine, Christian doctrine. He'll do this with gender and sexuality. I mean, let me give you just a brief example, okay? And this is probably an ultimate extreme, but I think it's going to prove my point. Uh, WUSA9.com ran this headline. They're a news organization. A candidate for Congress wants to legalize incest. And you can go look it up for yourself. I read this, this article um, by a few different people in the actual article myself. But there is a candidate in Virginia. He's running as an independent for Virginia's 10th congressional district. And he wants to legalize incest and pedophilia. Now, just because that is his diversity, that is his viewpoint, that doesn't mean that's something that we should accept or, in, or, or endorse. In fact, when he was asked about whether or not parents should have sexual relations with their children, he said, I think that that should be left up to the father's decision. Now, that's awful. I completely reject that viewpoint. It's unnatural. It's ungodly. It's not what we should want or support. And one of the reasons why is because we should have God's perspective. And so if pedophiles do not choose their feelings and they're people like everyone else, does that mean that we should celebrate and promote that kind of diversity? And I say, God forbid. And so when it comes to this subject of diversity, we must be compassionate, we must be transparent and understanding, but at the end of the day, as a Christian, we have to view things from God's perspective and his viewpoint. And so what we're going to look at next is simply this. When we look at diversity, it has to be on God's terms and not our own. And so let's look at for a moment what kind of diversity that we should have. If you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 3, because I think Galatians 3 provides this wonderful parameter of when God uses the word diversity, or when God says that we should accept and celebrate and endorse diversity, what kind of diversity should we have? What are the parameters of that diversity as the family of God should we promote and endorse? And I think that we'll find that right here in this passage. We're going to start here in verse 23 of Galatians chapter 3, and here's what Paul was saying. Now, as a little bit of backdrop, Paul was writing to a church who's struggling with what's called Galatianism. Now, what that means is simply this. God's grace gets you saved, but your good works keep you saved. So God's grace comes to you by faith, but what you do keeps you saved. So if you perform well, you are saved. If you don't perform well, you won't be saved. And what these Judaizers, they were these Jewish converts, they were telling people that you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And so they were appealing to the law. And Paul has some bad news for people who appeal to the law. He goes on to say later in chapter, chapter 5, he says, those who appeal to the law have fallen from grace. There's only two systems that you can be saved through. The law which appeals to your own works, or grace, which appeals to God through faith. And so in Galatians chapter 3, Paul's saying, look, there was a purpose for the law. The law was a tutor. It was a schoolmaster. It was a guardian that brought us to the grace of God. It brought us to Jesus Christ. And so we need to be saved through Christ. And that's what he starts off with here in verse 23. Look what he says. He says, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all who were baptized into Christ have clothed themselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. Back in verse 5 of this passage, Paul made his point emphatically clear. We are no longer under a tutor. And he says it again in verse 25. And so the purpose of the law was to prepare people to accept Jesus. That's why this guy named John the Baptist came on the scene. He was calling people, repent, come back to God. Get baptized for the baptism of repentance. Turn back to the law because a good Jew would be willing and ready to accept the Messiah who was to come. And so John's way was to basically pave this path for when Jesus come, it came and people would be ready to accept him. 
Now look what he says in verse 26. He says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Everyone who's a Christian is now a child of God. It doesn't matter. He goes on to list three different ways that we can compare this idea. But it doesn't matter where you've come from, how much money you make, what your gender is, male or female, okay, not like the 30 different genders that there are now, I guess people say, or whatever, but that's the classification, biologically, male and female. If you are one of those classes, you are equally saved under Christ. That's the idea that he's putting forth here. And so the scope of the sonship, the scope of childhood, is what, according to verse 26? He says, for those of you who are in Christ, you are equally saved. Now let's ask the question, The question is this, how are you all sons of God through faith? He gives us the answer in verse 27. He says, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Wow. The entry to a new life in Christ is by believer's baptism. F.F. Bruce, who's one of the greatest Christian commentators of of our time, he says this is the only reference to baptism in Galatians, and it is difficult to suppose that the readers would not have understood it as a statement about their initiatory baptism in water into the name of Jesus. Now, some people approach baptism with a presuppositional, theological, traditional viewpoint, and so they try to make the Bible say what it doesn't. But as a simple Christian, look, you all know I am simple, okay? I am not a very smart guy. I'm like below average. That's that's how I view myself. But it seems pretty simple to me. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so we've got to reject any type of traditional theology that enforces something on the text that's simply not there. Paul made it very clear in Ephesians 4 or 5. He says, now there is one baptism. There's not a spirit baptism and a water baptism and a metaphorical baptism. When he wrote Ephesians, he says, look, whatever happened before this age, whatever happened before their time, now there's one baptism. And it's the same baptism that he talked about all throughout the New Testament. Paul made it, you know, and I think, I like to speak from my own perspective. You guys know this. I share the good things and the bad things. You all know I love donuts. You guys know my wife is awesome and I'm a moron. I mean, these are things that I say on a general, you know, consistent basis. And so Paul, I think, here is speaking from his personal testimony. In Acts chapter 22, when Paul's recounting his personal experience and his testimony, he talks about how he encountered the Lord Jesus on, his road, on the road to Damascus, and there was a bright light, and he went blind for three days, and he was praying for three days. He didn't eat or drink for three days straight. I mean, this guy's life was wrecked. He believed in Jesus for three days. He just didn't know what to do. And he says in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, this guy named Ananias came to me, and he shared the gospel, and he says, Paul, what are you waiting on? Arise now, be baptized, washing away your sin. The Bible is emphatically clear that baptism is this time, this moment, not the means, the means is faith, but this time or moment when God changes his mind about us. And I think he pulls this reference in Galatians 3. I think he pulls it from this traditional thing that they would do. Often, they would change their garments. They would go down into the watery graves of baptism, and they would come back up, and they would put new garments on. And that's the idea, is that, man, when you become a Christian, you're wearing something different. Yeah, you might be from a different culture. Yeah, you might be from a different social class. Yeah, you might be a different gender. But when you come up out of the water graves of baptism, we all get the same gear. It's like we, if we were all wearing Under Armour or Nike, okay? We get the best stuff that there's out there. That's the idea that Paul is saying here in Galatians chapter 3. And so if you can think of it like this, what separates cultures more than their clothing? I mean, clothing, people, if you travel the world, people look extremely different. I mean, whether you go to Africa or Asia or Europe or South America, or right here in the States. I mean, even if you travel around the United States alone, you can tell pretty much maybe where somebody comes from by the clothes that they wear or how they identify themselves. Now, here's what's so beautiful, is that we are all different. But when it comes to our salvation, we all wear the same clothes. We all have equal value. A a diverse amount of people in the same group. We all belong to Jesus. That's what he's teaching here. Now remember, we're asking this question, what are the parameters of the diversity? And look what he says first of all in verse 28. He gives us three different phrases here, three different comparisons. Number one, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Neither Jew nor Greek. This is the greatest separation that you could have in biblical literature. 
Even in ancient literature, it would be awful if you were a Jew and you were compared to somebody who was a non-Jew. In fact, let me read to you a prayer that this dates back all the way to 150 AD. It probably preceded that. Here's, here's a prayer that a rabbi or a very pious spiritual Jew would pray. Let me read it to you. It's pretty awful. He says, Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has not made me a Gentile. Blessed art thou who has not made me a slave, and blessed art thou who has not made me a woman. Isn't that awful? In fact, if you were a woman, you were not even allowed to give testimony in a court of law. Had to be, had to be a male. I mean, you want to talk about a radical change. There is nothing that has done more for women than the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing that has done more for slaves than the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, Christianity is incredibly radical. And so Paul's initial statement, he says, there's three groups that I'm going to tell you about that's included in this diversity. First of all, when it comes to your cultural background, there's neither Jew and there's neither Greek. You don't have to be circumcised. That doesn't matter. In Christ, these distinctions are irrelevant in consideration of our salvation. And so Paul says, look, you are all sons of God. You are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And so we've got a radical separation here. And you could, if you could think of it like this, it's like mixing water and oil. Do you know there are crazy people who eat mayonnaise and, and uh, bananas? That's disgusting. There's people in our church that do that. I'm like, man, there can't be anything more inclusive and diverse than people who eat peanut butter and mayo and bananas together. I mean, that's just disgusting. It's like putting mayo in a donut. You just don't do that, man, you know? Ooh, gross. I just don't get it. But anyways, you know, God bless them. I'm sure, you know, they could, whatever. But it's like putting a cat in water, right? It's like putting a cat in water. I mean, these are things that just don't mix. But in Christ, they do mix. They are put together. Look, all right, if you eat mayo and, and bananas, I, I, we're cool. We're friends, okay? You can do that. I just, I just don't get it, man. I just say, hey, but, you know, you're my brother and you're my sister, whatever. Look what also he says in verse 28. He says, there is neither slave nor free. Now, slavery in the biblical times, it had some relationship for what we have experienced in the last 200 years of our American culture, this idea of um, enslaving someone, this southern slavery, but it was, it was a little bit different. I said some of that last week, how sometimes people would actually sell themselves into slavery, and they could have a great relationship with their master, and often they could inherit. Um, they could be adopted as a child or a son of God, um, a, a son of the, the master, not a son of God. But, but it was a little bit different than what it's like today. That's, that's the main idea. Remember, I'm simple. I'm not that smart, okay? So uh, I put words together, and I make up new words, and I don't say stuff that's right. That's just me. So he has this idea. He says, you're neither slave nor free. Now, at, at the birth of Jesus, slavery was pretty difficult. And masters actually had the ability they could kill their own slaves. They could um, use their slaves in pretty much any means that they wanted to. And the slaves were basically the property of the master, and so whatever roles people held in the secular world, in Christ, they were equal. It's like if you go out today, and you've got your boss, and you're a low-level employee. And yeah, you may, be, have, you may have a, a distinct in your job, but the moment that you come together in this group of people, you are equal in your value. It doesn't matter how much money you make or who's in charge. In fact, this is what's so cool about Christianity. In fact, when it comes to the nature of the church, the CEO could actually be the one who's a low-level servant in the church, and the low-level servant in the community can actually be the leader because worldly status doesn't matter in the kingdom of God. And so I long for the day where we have a church, and I think that we do, where we have a church of rich people, poor people, people who have great jobs and bad jobs, people from different cultures and different ethnic backgrounds, but we all work together and we all do things to the glory of God. That's what it means to have a diverse church. And then thirdly, he says this, neither male nor female. Now, I already read you that prayer about what a Jewish man would say. Thank God. Thank you, God, that I'm not a woman. And that's, that's awful. That's terrible. I, I don't think Jesus ever prayed something like that. But let me give you a little bit more information about the Jewish perspective on women in the first century. They had this writing called the Talmud. And it basically was an interpretation of the scriptures. It had uh, a, a traditional interpretation, this idea of the Jewish idea of, of what, the, what their Bible taught. And this is what it had to say about women. Women are greedy, inquisitive, lazy, vain. That's awful. Happy is he whose children are males 
and woe to him whose children are females. The rabbis taught this, may the word of the Torah be burned that they should be handed over to women. I mean, it's just, it's awful. We should reject that. That is, that is visceral to God. I mean, God looks at that and he just turns his nose up at it. And it's horrible. It's not what Jesus taught. It's not what the Bible teaches. And so put yourself in the audience of Paul. And he's writing to a culture who not only believes this, but promotes it. And Paul says, look, when it comes to salvation in Jesus, women and men are equal. They're equal in their value. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, a slave or free, a Jew or a Gentile. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, here's what's unfortunate. What's unfortunate is that our culture could look at a passage like this, and this is Satan's tactic, and twist it in such a way that now says everyone's equal in value and function. And that's where I would draw a line. Look, men and women are different. Yes, they have equal value, but no, they are different in their function. And when it comes to the nature of the church and the nature of the family, God has a lot to say about the structure of the family unit. Men are different than women. It's the same thing out in the world. I mean, imagine a slave reading this passage of Scripture and going out in the world to his job and to his boss and saying, hey, I'm in charge now, or we're equally in charge. Well, that would be insane. That's not what Paul was saying here. He's not saying, well, now everything is equal and everybody has the same function. What he's talking about, this parameter, this diversity, is when it comes to salvation in Christ Jesus. And so this scripture does not cancel out the separate and distinct roles that men and women have in the home or in the church. And while women and men are equal in value, they are certainly not equal in function. We have different responsibilities. We can't do what each other can do. Now look what Paul concludes this passage of scripture with. He says, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, verse 28. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We live in a world that separates people into groups and categories and views certain people more important than others. And there's all different kinds of divisions and factions, and we've listed a few here this morning. But under Jesus, all have put on Christ, all look like Christ, all belong to Christ, And when you stand before God as you, you're going to have this bright white robe on and God's going to look at you and he's not going to see your gender. He's not going to see your social status. He's not going to see whether or not you have an ethnic background from this place or that. He's going to see his son. He's going to see his righteousness. And that is good news. That is, in fact, great news. And so the kind of diversity that we should have is in the realm of gender, specifically male and female, social status, slave and free, and ethnic identity, Jew or Gentile. Now the reason we should be for diversity is because God is for diversity. He really truly is. God promoted diversity. Look, he created male and female, men and women. You can look at the Genesis account for that. He created women diverse from men. Women are different. I read this post, women are not meant to be understood, they're meant to be loved. That's how guys think. I have no idea what this person is like, but I love them anyways. And some of you women are sitting there thinking, yeah, we think the exact same thing. (laughs) Because we're different. That's what we are, and that's okay. It's okay to be different. God promoted diversity. In Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11, God created different languages. And he let people go out and speak different languages. And so God is okay with people being different in the languages that they speak. God permitted diversity with cultures. Look, the Bible was written over a span of 1,500 years by three different languages, written by 40 different people. Think about that. And it was written to people who were Greeks, who were Romans, who were Israelites, who were Palestinians, who were Egyptians, and Persians. I mean, the Bible is the most diverse collection of writings that you could ever be exposed to. God is for diversity. But most importantly, God sent Jesus to die for a diverse group of people. Revelation is a beautiful book that a lot of people misunderstood, and they misunderstand today. Everybody wants to take Revelation and project it only into the future, right? Revelation is primarily a historical book. And my approach to the book of Revelation is it's written in seven different stories said seven different times. If you look at the the book of Revelation, it has a a cycle to it. It tells the story, and right before the end, it starts the story over again, and it'll add a few different details as it goes through. But there is some futuristic theology in Revelation, and there is this beautiful picture of Jesus 
standing before the throne, and he looks as if he's a lamb, as if he's a lamb that's been slain. So God looks out, and he gives this vision to John, and there's Jesus, and he looks like a lamb, an innocent lamb that's been slain, and God sees the blood of Jesus, his son. And there's a song that erupts from these living creatures that are around the throne. I want you to look at this song. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, it says, They sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book, speaking of Jesus, and to break its seals, for you were slain, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation. That's awesome. The blood of Jesus goes not just to Americans, not just to Europeans or South Americans, Middle Eastern, Asian, Australian, whatever language or tongue or ethnic background you are, when God sees the end and these angels, these beasts erupt into glory, they sing this song that God has saved people from every single background and language and tongue. And that is great news. That is great news. God is for diversity. In fact, Jesus sent his disciples to save a diverse group of people. In Matthew chapter 28, we're not going to go there, but when Jesus sent his disciples out into the world, he says, go into all the world and make disciples. Not just go into Judea or go into Samaria or go into the Greek islands, but go into the entire world and make followers after me. You want to talk about a passage of scripture that's for diversity. That is one. In fact, Paul, he preaches one of the most famous sermons in Acts chapter 17. It was on this gigantic hill this big stone, and Paul has all of these Greek people and all of these different people from different cultures, and they're selling different things, and Paul gets up, and he preaches this incredible sermon, and this is what he says. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Man, it was always God's plan to include as many people as possible. And I believe that the Bible teaches that God foreordained the world in such a way that the most people would be saved and the least people would be lost. And that includes people from every generation, every background, every tongue, every ethnic group. Glory to God. As I said, Revelation is written in cycles. And later on in the book of Revelation, John, who is a Jewish apostle, he sees this incredible vision in Revelation 7. And what he sees, he sees 12 groups, right, 12 groups, and there's 12,000 in each group. It might be 10,000. I'd have to go back and double check. Anyways, regardless, these are his Jewish brothers and sisters. That's what he sees. He sees just these Jewish brothers and sisters. And he has a little bit of a dialogue with an elder there. And then Revelation goes on to say he turns around to see the exact same group of people, but something is dynamically different. Look at what it says. After these things, he says, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and all people and all tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. He's looking at the end, and he sees the eternal salvation of God, and he sees a bunch of different kinds of people, so many people he couldn't even count them all. God is for diversity, and if God is for diversity, we should be for diversity too. And ultimately, if I could put it in one statement, it would simply be this. God's ultimate goal is to combine unity and diversity in such a way that provides an opportunity for unlimited fellowship. Man, I think it's cool when people from two different backgrounds, you could even consider them two different enemies from where they've come from. Under the banner of the cross, they are one. And they love each other. And we could use funny ideas like people from different sports teams, you know, like the Redskins or the Dallas Cowboys or whatever. The idea is simply this. The most territorial, horrible wall between people, race, and social status has been torn down and broken down under the banner of the cross, and everyone is saved equally. Glory be to God. And so if Christ died for people of every nation and every language, and God shows this this eternal picture of every nation and every language, the question is this, what part are we playing in accomplishing God's goals from his perspective? What part do you play? Well, I've got three things that I want to encourage you to do before you leave here today. Number one, practice impartial hospitality. When it comes to church practices, 
when it comes to our upcoming fall fest, when it comes to inviting people into your home, practice impartial hospitality. Don't just go after the people that everyone wants because they have a good job or they don't smell, okay? So I probably won't ever get invited over here. Man, after I preach, I like try to give a buffer zone. You know what I mean? I always pop mints in my mouth. Preacher's breath is awful. It's terrible. So if you come up here, I will have a mint in my mouth, okay? Don't be, don't be afraid. But the idea is simply this. Show impartial hospitality. If you're white, invite somebody over that doesn't look like you. If you're rich, invite somebody over that doesn't have as much as you. If you're whatever, invite somebody different into your house. Be diverse, be intentional. James put it like this. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin. So without prejudice to certain teachings over all the others, he says, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. May we rid ourselves of favoritism. May we eradicate this idea of people that we like and we want to be around. And I think if we do it like this, if we go after the people that nobody wants, God will send us the people that everyone wants. If we go after the people who are broken, who are poor, who are dirty, who are wrapped up in sin, who are enslaved to drug abuse, if we go after the people that nobody wants, God will send us the people that everybody wants. So we as a church should practice impartial hospitality, number one. Number two, follow God's commands emphatically. When Paul wrote to Timothy in First, uh, first Timothy and Second Timothy, Timothy had some really hard stuff to do. I mean, when it came to setting up the functions of the church or rebuking people who were in sin or rebuking false teachers, people who crept into the church and started teaching weird stuff and strange doctrines, I mean, Timothy was so sick that his stomach was a knot. And Paul said, look, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. In other words, stop drinking water only. You've got to get something else in your system. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. I mean, that's, that's how affected Timothy was by, by the church culture that he was in. But Paul gave him this bold command. And so I share this bold command with you too. When it comes to the teachings of the cross, when it comes to biblical Christianity, here's what Paul, here's what Paul says. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in the spirit of partiality. And man, this is tough. There are certain Bible teachings that, look, you may not want to share. Don't be partial with the word of God stand on his truth, stand up for what the Bible teaches, boldly proclaim it, and remember from from the last couple weeks, speak it in such a way that edifies the other person, but most importantly, that honors God. And so follow the, the teachings of Christ emphatically, and then thirdly and finally, we must flee from the sin of partiality. Look, it's not just about not doing something. It's about doing something different. We can't just say, well, I'm not impartial because I've never been prejudiced to anyone. But here's a question. Have you gone out of your way to seek people that aren't like you? 